Welcome, comrades. Good evening. Thank you for joining us uh, for another session in our series to look at the history of Israel and Palestine. Um, many of you will have been there last week when we started looking at the relationship of anti-Semitism and Zionism. Um, and we know, of course, about the weaponization of anti-Semitism, which is uh, many of us are of, <laughs> of its victims, where anti-Zionism has been conflated with anti-Semitism and, uh, you know, criticizing Israel has been uh, the new def definition of, of anti-Semitism. But we want to look at this question in a more historic context, though no doubt in the discussion we'll get to the to, to the current context as well. Very pleased that we have again with us Thomas Suarez and Tony Greenstein. Um, you will have seen in the emails there two books that you can purchase online and I would recommend both. Tonight we're starting with Thomas, um, 20, 25 minutes, then Tony, and then we'll open up for questions and comments from the floor. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tina. Uh, I like to preface this by by saying that I do not like the term anti-Semitism, and I think it should be abandoned uh, in favor of anti-Jewish bigotry. To me, the use of a dedicated term for bigotry against Jews, as opposed to bigotry against anyone else, feeds into the notion of Jewish exceptionalism. It is also illogical and inaccurate in its use of the term Semitic, and above all, for reasons I will explain later on, the term anti-Semitism, in my view, aids Israeli impunity. It is an asset in Israel's wielding of the smear of anti-Jewish bigotry to silence critics. But I will continue to use the word anti-Semitism here, as I often do, just to avoid distracting from the larger issue at hand. So first, I think we should look at the various roles that anti-Semitism plays in the Israeli state and in uh, its ongoing genocide. One, anti-Semitism is, of course, the alleged rationale for Zionism and the Israeli state. Two, for devotees of the Zionist cult, anti-Semitism is both the threat and the fetish that keeps, uh, keeps a, a Zionist obedient. Three, the transference of historic Western anti-Jewish bigotry onto Palestinian identity is core to the dehumanization of the Palestinians that Israel requires to justify its slow and at present, not so slow, genocide against the Palestinians. Four, anti-Semitism is Zionism's essential fuel that it must ensure never runs out. And thus, five, the, uh, the cry of anti-Semitism, real or fake, is key to money raising as a tool for the, the Zionists. And six, the false smear of anti-Semitism is, of course, the principal weapon wielded to squash opposition to its crimes. All its weapons of steel and explosives would be useless without this weapon. Seven, importantly, anti-Jewish bigots were courted by the Zionist movement with anti-Semitism used as a positive marketing strategy. If you don't want Jews showing up on your shores, support us, support Zionism because we have a huge ghetto for them far away from you. And so, eight, the last point, actual anti-Semitism, white nationalism and neo-fascism are soulmates of Zionism, as is the anti-Semitism of the rapidly pro-Israel Christian Zionist movement. In short, anti-Semitism is integral to the Israeli state, a multi-purpose, inseparable tool Israel is woven out of anti-Semitism. Now, a quick look at the beginning of it all. I'd like to quote the correspondent for the London Standard, reporting on the first Zionist Congress in 1897. He reported the following. The idea of founding a modern Jewish state, which goes by the name of Zionism, finds little favor in Germany except among the anti-Semites. The Frankfurter Zeitung, he wrote, sums up an article on the subject as follows. In short, the degeneration which calls itself anti-Semitism has begotten the degeneration which adorns itself 
with the name of Zionism. And so anti-Semitic should have been the epitaph that buried Zionism along with Theodor Herzl. But Herzl and those who followed fought back through the only tactic that could counter Zionism's obvious anti-Semitic nature. They claimed worldwide Jewish allegiance to Zionism and crowned Zionism as the standard by which good Jews and bad Jews are distinguished. I'll quote Herzl on the matter, and this is one of, of several rather horrific quotes from the, uh, the so-called father of modern Zionism. Quote, no true Jew can be anti-Zionist. Only Malchul is one, this being a very offensive word uh, for a religious Jew. Merely to look at him, let alone approach or, heaven forbid, touch him, was enough to make us feel sick. So here we have the beginning of the hijacking of Jewish identity by this racial nationalist movement, resulting in the nation state today that calls itself the Jewish state. Now, we accept this trilogy of words, the, tr the Jewish state, with little thought, but even on the obvious level, the term the Jewish state already creates a magic shield around Israel. Uh, compare the psychological difference between why are you always criticizing whatever state versus why are you always criticizing the Jewish state? The term the Jewish state serves as a weapon that shoots its bullets without leaving any forensic evidence. It empowers the smear of anti-Semitism in the most insidious way because it strikes without the overt accusation thus making the victim not even the option of responding to the smear unless he or she raises the issue of anti-Semitism, which only has the appearance of vindicating the smear. So, in order to disable this magic shield, we need to look inside to see what powers it. Under the hood, we see that the Jewish state is a stealth term that creates a messianic gateway to the public mind, sparking its message of exceptionalism past any critical thought. There is an entire world of narrative hidden within these three words, the most powerful of which is the article, the. Israel does not claim to be merely a Jewish state in the sense of countries that have a national religion. Indeed, to quote David Ben-Gurion, Israel has nothing to do with Judaism, but rather with his words, being a Jew, and nor with being just an Israeli Jew, but the ethnicity itself. According to Israel's construct, it is the state of all Jews as Jews, free of national borders and indeed free of, uh, free of individual Jewish consent on the matter. This is anti-Semitism, and it is unique in the world. There is no analogy to it with any other nation state. As much as Israel's apologists try to pass it off uh, as analogous to any other state with a national religion. Simple experiment to prove that. Uh, there are multiple Christian states. There are multiple Muslim states, Hindu states, Buddhist, uh, Buddhist states. Now, imagine that somewhere, some state in the world were to establish itself and declare that it is a Jewish state, just like Israel. No, Israel would go ballistic. It would say, no, you can't be the Jewish state. We are the Jewish state. For states with an official religion, that officialness extends to their border and stops. Such states neither claim exclusivity on the religion or its various cultures and traditions, nor to have any claim on co-religionist citizens of other countries. Israel is the opposite. Israel is the only Jewish state, uh, as its apologists constantly remind us, not in the sense that there happen to be no others, but because by Israel's construct, there can be no other. Its claim over Jews is global and involves ethnicity itself, not citizenship. This nation state adaptation of tribalism in which the state is part of the DNA of an ethnic identity bears no relation to states with a national religion. It is the internal workings of its weapon of silencing critics through the smear of anti-Semitism. Now, where else do we come across this same mentality? It is the method of common bigots. 
racists blame individuals by virtue of claimed oneness with some ethnicity or nationality or type. And so an obvious example, during the spread of COVID-19, Chinese looking people were attacked because the virus came from China. They, the Chinese, caused COVID. Now, this is classic ignorant bigotry, and we all condemn it. Israel's magic shield works by doing precisely this to Jews, but turning it around in order to hold Jewish identity ransom to insulate its crimes. And instead of condemning this anti Semitism, we run in fear from it, which is doubly tragic because we are also running in fear from Zionism's fatal flaw. We would say Israel did X, Y, Z. A bigot would say the Jews did X, Y, Z. But that bigot is now the Israeli state and its cheerleaders who have made state and ethnicity synonymous in order to repackage criticism of the state as anti-Semitic. Other states deflect criticism of their crimes by hiding behind the flag, accusing dissenting citizens of being unpatriotic to the state. Israel instead hides behind the ethnicity free of borders, accusing dissenting voices anywhere of being traitors to the ethnicity. Now, we're all familiar with the IHRA pseudo definition of anti-Semitism, which is not a definition of anything, but rather a tool to silence Israel's critics and thus to empower Israel's crimes. Now, IHRA does, however, contain one truth. It states that it is anti-Semitic to hold Jews collectively responsible for the actions of the Israeli state. Well, yes, of course. But that, ironically, is precisely what IHRA is engineered to do. That's its purpose. That is the inner workings of the smear and of Zionism. You don't even need to unscrew the cover of IHRA to look inside to see how it works. It's a very simple and obvious mechanism. What Israel does, the Jews do. And so to accuse the state of crimes is to accuse Jews as Jews of those crimes, of which, uh, which of course is blatant anti-Jewish bigotry, and we must start saying so. The same tactic that Israel wields to silence us is its Achilles heel, but we have collectively been so beaten down that we have not exploited it. Israel's theft of Jewish identity makes it Jews as Jews because they are Jews the doers of its crimes. Traditional anti-Semitism, for all its horrors, is powerless to harm the integrity of Jews or Judaism. It's it's powerless to make its libels true. The Israeli state and Zionism, if we accept them at their word, succeed. If we accept their claims on Jewish identity, then we are the common racist blaming Jews as Jews. The, the very name Israel is, of course, also part of the weaponization of the smear of anti-Semitism. From anyone from the larger Western tradition, and I include secular people, the name Israel exists apart from all other place names. Its very sound transcends the realm of the profane and touches a nerve deep within our, our collective cultural subconscious. It is a place rooted in Genesis itself, and Israel, the modern nation state, very openly exploits this to position itself as that place and the land's ancient artifacts as the nation state's artifacts and its settlers as that biblical land's people. Now, as laughable as that may and certainly should sound, its power is very real and is the reason the name was chosen. The Zionist use of Hebrew, this great venerable ancient language, as the vernacular operates in tandem for the weaponization of anti-Semitism. Hebrew was necessary for the theater of the messianic return to the biblical lands. It too is an artifact exploited, an artifact serving to place the Israeli state in a protective part of our collective psyche. To criticize someone speaking he Hebrew is, in this militarization, to criticize Jews. So Zionism has hijacked Jewish identity and turned it into a racial supremacist cult. Why is this not blatantly obvious to the general public? 
my view is this. What, as seen by the public, are the two sides to what they are told is a conflict? Well, they would say they would say that it's it's obviously Israel versus the Palestinians or versus the Arabs. Now, to me, this juxtaposition is very misleading and it hides Israel's anti-Semitism. Question, what it is what is it about the Palestinians that makes Israel target them? Why does Israel place them under apartheid, ethically cleanse them, and commit genocide against them? Why? It's not because they're Palestinians. It's not because they're Arabs. It is solely, solely because they are not Jewish. If they were Jewish, whether Palestinian or Arab or anything else, they would instead be welcomed by Israel and given a generous subsidy to take over a house whose owner was expelled because he or she is not Jewish. Jews were always part of the fabric of Arab Palestinian civilization until the arrival of the Zionists. The Zionists extracted all Jews from Palestinian civilization, robbing them of their Arab identity. More Zionist anti-Semitism. That the rest were by definition not Jewish and nothing else is why Israel has condemned them to apartheid, Pontistans, and camps, and why the Zionist militias depopulated several hundred villages in 1948 and continues to depopulate them in the West Bank and especially in Gaza and East Jerusalem. The core goal of Zionism is a racially pure, quote unquote, Jewish state from river to sea. Anyone there who is not Jewish is to be gotten rid of. So yes, Palestinians are the targets, but they are the targets not because they are Palestinian per se, but because they are the non-Jewish Palestinians. The ongoing genocide in Gaza and in slower motion in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, and of course within Israel itself, is all part of Zionism's grotesquely anti-Semitic crime of hijacking Jewish identity into a racial supremacist cult. Describing the situation as between Israel and the Palestinians or the Arabs falsely frames this racial nationalism as uh, something like a real estate dispute, a, a conflict, and indeed provides Israel the rhetorical gymnastics through which it denies it is an apartheid regime. Accurately describing the situation as Israel's ethnic cleansing of Palestinian non-Jews exposes Israel's crimes against Jews. It's hijacking of Jewish identity as a human shield to insulate its crimes in the name of Jews. Thus, the Israeli state is genocidal in its very nature, as its goal is and always has been to effectively erase the original ethnic identity by expulsion and the hijacking of their cultural iconography as its own. Israel is, in effect, conducting genocide and blaming it on the Jews. Israel's squandering of Jewish identity to insulate its crimes is also obvious if we look at the people who were ethnically cleansed in 1948 and beyond through to this very moment because they are not Jewish and have for generations been reduced to life in camps. What, what do we call these camps? Again, in my view, unfortunately, playing right into Israel's narrative, we call them refugee camps, shielding Israel from this aspect of its abuse of Jewish identity. No, what is a refugee camp? It is a camp for people displaced by conflict or natural disaster on account of which are unable to return home. But this has not applied to the Palestinians for 75 years. Since the end of 1948, they have been perfectly able to go home, have wanted nothing more than to go home, have the unqualified individual right to go home, and there is nothing stopping them from going home, except that the Israeli state blocks them. Why does it block them? It blocks them because they are not Jewish. So th these are not refugee camps. They are Israeli internment camps for non-Jews. Israeli internment camps for non-Jews paid for by the so-called international community. 
The term refugee camps obscures this crime Israel is committing in the name of Jews, making the fact that millions of people wake up every morning to the squalor of camps. This sound like some tragedy of circumstances. No, they are imprisoned by Israel in these internment camps because they are not Jewish. End of story. As an example of how cynical is Israel's theft of Jewish identity and its obsession with so-called racial Jewish purity. One of these Israeli internment camps for non-Jews, Shufat, is already in what Israel claims to be Israel. According to Israel, East Jerusalem, where the camp is, is Israeli as much a part of the state as any other. So the people of Shufat camp don't even need to return. They're already there, but they're in camps. They're in camps, even though, according to Israel, they're in Israel. They're in camps in order to preserve Israel's self professed identity, the Jewish state. The Jewish state is a truly remarkable term in that its exterior demands unqualified respect, while its interior hides a neo-fascist, racist abuse of Jewish identity. All this, in my view, must be called out for the grotesque anti-Semitism that it is over and over and over again. The genocide against the Palestinians is not a problem of the Palestinians, it is a problem of Israel. Yet 75 years of exposing Israel's crimes has not stopped it. So why? In my view, one, not the only, but one major reason is that we have failed to condemn Israel for its anti-Semitic exploitation and abuse, and instead allowed it to exploit and abuse the smear of anti-Jewish bigotry. Since its purpose is to protect the state itself, not Jews, and since the very mission of the state is a racist one, anti-racists, that is the vast majority of the people working for Palestinian liberation, are the targets of the smear whereas actual anti-Jewish bigots and even neo-fascists are not targets because they are invariably avid supporters of the state. I came of age during the height of the US-led war against Vietnam, and like many other people of all ages at the time, I was active in the movement to stop it. Now, we were called traitors and God knows what, but traitors to what? traitors to a state of which I was a citizen by happenstance of the geography of my birth. It was and remains an external aspect, not part of my DNA. The citizenship is like belonging to a club. Everyone, well, everyone except the Palestinians and other stateless people automatically belong to one of these clubs and sometimes join another or, or another club or resign from one of these clubs. But people brainwashed from birth by Zionism believe that Zionist ideology and the Israeli state are part of who they are. And it is for this reason that Israel does not allow Israeli nationality for Jews. The nationality of Jewish citizens of Israel is, by Israeli law, Jewish. Israel claims a hold on Jews by what it treats as race, and thus cannot be renounced. Israel claims to own Jews as Jews. One, just one example of how this plays out in the 1980s, uh, during former uh, Stern Gang bigwit Yitzhak Shamir's second term as Israeli prime minister, Russia finally allowed Jews to leave. Most wanted to go to the United States, which had always been the favorite destination. Shamir was furious. He called them defectors and successfully coerced U.S. President Reagan to close its doors to the United States in order to force them to go to Israel, where they were needed as placeholders for the state's expansion into the West Bank. In my view, this psychosis, this drug of anti-Semitism to which Zionism has gotten its devotees addicted, is why we have the phenomena of, Jewish, of Zionist Jews faking anti-Semitic incidents such as 
uh, scrawling swastikas on the wall of their of their dormitory door, this sort of thing, even bomb scares, a phenomena that I believe is more widespread than has been acknowledged. Anti-Semitism has become a racket. For many years, organizations such as the, we all know these, the uh, Campaign Against Anti-Semitism, the Community Service Trust, and the Board of Deputies, or, or in the United States, the, uh, the Anti-Defamation League, have been devoted to maintaining an ever-increasing hysteria over anti-Semitism, both to keep Zionism's adherents terrified and satisfied, and to keep us silent. Now, does anyone remember any of these organizations announcing great news? Anti-Semitism has declined this quarter or even leveled off. No, it is so farcical that several years ago, the Daily Mail reported that, quote, Jews feel as threatened as they did in the Holocaust, experts say. And there has been no let up since. Yet the media continued to parrot one new alarm after the other without betraying the slightest curiosity. I'd like to close just with a practical observation about the militarization of anti-Semitism. What to do if you are falsely smeared with the anti-Semitism label? Absolute rule, never respond on the terms handed to you. Do not respond with protestations of your innocence, nor with any form of pseudo-apology for anything you didn't do, thinking you will placate the inquisitors. The smear is to silence you, of course, but they're also thrilled if you protest because anti-Semitism remains the issue, you remain on the defensive, and because the words Palestine and apartheid and genocide are nowhere to be found. In my view, and I feel strongly that I am correct, at least in this, when the scarlet letter A for anti-Semitism is scrawled on your chest, you should instead correctly boomerang the charge back, and it must include the words that the smear was intended to silence. In other words, along the lines of, no, don't insult Jewish identity to cover up the the genocide of non-Jewish Palestinians in Israel and Palestine, or uh, I'm arguing for simple human rights, you are smearing Jews as opposing these, or no, the only anti-Jewish bigotry here is from those defending Israeli apartheid, ethnic cleansing, and genocide in the name of Jews. It is common, it is common for the uh, proposal of equality, simple equality, river to sea, one state, uh, or even equality within Israel itself to be dismissed as anti-Semitic. This has to be thrown back at them, exposed for the racist outrage it is. It is, in effect, it is overtly claiming that Jews are bigots because they they can't deal with, it, with uh, equality. Here, by the way, is why I maintain that the term anti-Semitism, rather than anti-Jewish bigotry, serves as an asset to Israel. The smear anti-Semitic is a blunt weapon that obscures precisely what it is that is being alleged. If instead the accuser is forced to clarify that bigotry against Jews is the accusation, that puts the onus on the accuser to explain why, for example, arguing for equal rights river to sea is somehow anti-Jewish, it suddenly becomes more transparent that it is the accuser, not the accused, who is libeling Jews. Uh, Israel, the world's great purveyor of anti-Jewish bigotry, has created a world of smoke and mirrors out of the crime to grease the wheels of genocide. It is long overdue to clear the smoke and mirrors. It is not enough to say that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. Rather, Zionism is anti-Semitism. It is convoluted to say that criticism of Israel is not anti-Semitic. Rather, adulation of Israel is far, far more likely to spring from anti-Semitism. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm very curious now to hear Tina's and Tony's thoughts on this. Thank you.
Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tom. We had a couple of people uh, asking if your thoughts uh, would be possible to have that as a, a written transcript, your speech, because there was a lot, a lot in it. And do you, do you have your speech in, as a transcript that we could perhaps um, send around? I, I have just a couple of key words, but I can write them out. Oh, well, if you have time, that would be fantastic. That was a really very interesting in, uh, introduction. Thank you very much, Tom. Yeah. Um, over to you, Tony. <laughs> Follow that with your bullet points. Okay, comrades. Uh, uh, this is a session where Tom and I are speaking uh, to work, uh, on the same theme, uh, relatively speaking, but I also think it could be a debate because I do have serious differences with Tom as well, uh, which uh, I, I hope also to elaborate uh, and then maybe we can have quite a fruitful discussion. Yeah, Tony, why don't you start with uh, what's new and then we at the end towards your presentation we can concentrate on where you disagree and we can bring Tom back in. Well, well, they're, they're integral in a sense to what I'm saying. That's why I don't think it's possible to formulate it in, in that way with respect. Uh, firstly, I don't have any problem with the term anti-Semitism. I think it's a historically formulated uh, concept which has developed, as I say, the first person who popularized it was Wilhelm Helmar in 1879, Ma, who was a German anti-Semite or anti-Jewish racist, uh, formed the League uh, of Anti-Semites, although he recanted uh, very late towards the end of his life. Uh, but uh, his idea when he talked about anti-Semitism uh, was that Jews weren't really Europeans, they were Semites, they uh, came from the Middle East and therefore they did not belong. Uh, Likewise, uh, Tom says that uh, Zionism involves a theft of Jewish identity. Uh, that presupposes that there is one single fixed identity of being Jewish. I would disagree. On the contrary, uh, Jewish identity has changed many times throughout history, as has anti-Semitism itself. Uh, and I think that's the key point. Likewise, uh, Tom says, what is it about the Palestinians? They are subject to the various forms of discrimination that we all know, including, of course, the denial of the right to return. And he says, the main problem with it is that they're not Jewish. Again, I disagree. Uh, because if that was the case, then there'd be a very simple answer, which is, to convert them to becoming Jewish, or at least allow them to becoming uh, to become Jewish, but in fact the Israeli conversion uh, ministry uh, or authority, and there is such a thing, specifically refuses to allow anyone who is a Palestinian to convert to Judaism, and the reason for that, I think, is quite simple: that the Palestinians are the untermention, the, the lower race, or however you term it. And their main problem isn't so much they're not Jewish, but they are the indigenous population. And this fits into the settler colonial paradigm that uh, in South Africa, a black person could not become white, uh, a Jew could not become an Aryan, uh, and a Palestinian cannot become Jewish in Israeli terms. Uh, I, I think it's important to take that on board. I think what Zionism has done and is doing, and it's a very conscious uh, attempt on their part, is to redefine anti-Semitism. Because uh, anti-Semitism is not a difficult concept, uh, concept. It's hostility to or discrimination or prejudice against Jews. I mean, you can look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary. There's a very simple definition. You don't need the IHRA, which is over 500 words with its 11 uh, poisonous examples, most of which are about Israel, in order to understand what anti-Semitism is. I often give the example uh, say, of my own father, who uh, 
took part in the Battle of Cable Street in October 1936 uh, against the Mosleyites who were trying to march through uh, the Jewish East End of London. Uh, you know, he didn't need a definition of anti-Semitism to know what it was. Uh, and likewise, none of us need a definition of anti-Semitism to know what it does is. But if you're redefining anti-Semitism as something altogether different from what people understand, then of course you do need this definition. And the definition, the IHRA, which uh, was formulated originally as uh, the European Union Monitoring Committee, uh, Commission definition of anti-Semitism, the working definition of anti-Semitism originated in 2005 from Tel Aviv University. It was a conscious attempt to create what uh, is called the new anti-Semitism. In other words, why are people hostile to Israel? Not because of what it does, but because of what it is. It was the Jew amongst the nations. I think it was Owen Kotber, who was the former Canadian uh, Minister of Justice, who first came up uh, with the term. So th those are just really a few opening remarks uh, on my part. Uh, I, I've asked, what is anti-Semitism? Uh, and I, I think Abraham Leon, who, who wrote it, a book whose importance I cannot stress, the, uh, the Jewish question, a Marxist interpretation. And he wrote about the Zionists uh, that Zionism transposes modern antisemitism to all of history and saves itself the trouble of studying the various forms of antisemitism and their evolution. And uh, I, I think people need to understand that and to try and take it on board that the Zionist idea is that anti-Semitism is one long continuum and that it's never changed. It's always been around. And it was summed up by one of the earliest Zionists, Leon Pinsker, uh, in a book that he wrote in 1882 or 1881, was it, uh, Auto-Emancipation. Uh, Pinsker was a doctor. And so he described anti-Semitism as Judeophobia, literally the fear of Jews. Uh, and he wrote, uh, and again, I quote, Judeophobia is then a mental disease. And as a mental disease, it is hereditary, because that was what the belief was at the time, that uh, if someone was mentally ill, uh, they had inherited this. And, and having been inherited for 2,000 years, it is incurable. Uh, and so that really was the Zionist starting point. That if anti-Semitism was, was this mental disease and it had been inherited for 2,000 years and it was incurable, what possible reason was there to fight it? I mean, you don't fight an incurable disease. You provide a palliative. You provide pain relief. But there's no point in treating it uh, if the treatment itself will only exacerbate the pain uh, of the condition. So, I mean, that was the Zionist approach. You couldn't fight anti-Semitism. And so if you couldn't fight it, you had to take the next best step, which was to separate yourself out from the non-Jews and to form your own Jewish state. And that's exactly the solution that Zionism uh, adopted. Let us remember that anti-Semitism in the sense that we understand it uh, was particularly prevalent in Tsarist Russia in the Pale of Settlement. Uh, and it was sponsored and inspired from the top, from the, the state itself. Uh, and many thousands of Jews died uh, as a result or were injured. The most famous example of a pogrom was in the 1903 pogrom in Kishinev when uh, I think about 50 Jews died, hundreds were injured and so on. But in the period from 1880 to uh, about 19, 1910, thousands of Jews uh, died. Now the Jewish reaction, the majority Jewish reaction, the overwhelming Jewish major uh, reaction was to fight it, to oppose it, to form Jewish self-defense squads, to combine with others. And if they couldn't fight it, if it was too overwhelming, to emigrate, 
And of course, Jews did emigrate from Soros, Russia, something like two and a half million uh, emigrated between uh, the middle of the 19th century uh, and the beginning of the First World War. Of those, something like 1% went to what the Zionists would claim was their natural historic home, Palestine. The vast majority went to the United States or to Britain. Often they went to Britain as a stopover to the United States and never uh, made it out again. But that was uh, the reaction of the vast majority of Jews uh, uh, to anti-Semitism. Uh, and if you like, the question uh, we must ask ourselves is, what is Zionism therefore? What, what did it become? It, it, it was certainly a reaction to anti-Semitism, but it also developed a life of its own. Uh, and I would define the Zionist project as being a racial preservation project, primarily. It was about restoring and perpetuating uh, the ancient Jewish people, the myth of the Jewish uh, people or the Jewish race, really, because it was a racial concept. Uh, fundamental to any uh, to Zionist belief was the idea of the Jewish nation, that wherever you lived, whatever language you spoke, if you were Jewish, you were part of the same nation. And that, in reality, is not a nation. I mean, uh, we don't know, need to go into a debate about what is and isn't a nation. But I think it's commonly accepted that people in the same nation will occupy the same territory, will share the same economy, they will speak the same language, uh, and they may well have a, a similar or the same uh, culture. This is simply not true uh, of Jews. I mean, Jews spread throughout the globe, India, China, Latin America, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so to speak of one common Jewish nation uh, is to say a, a racial concept. And I think Ben-Gurion, uh, uh, see if I can actually bring it up. Uh, I think uh, Ben-Gurion summed it up best. Uh, this was in 1938. And this was just after Kristallnacht, which was the major Nazi pogrom against the Jews when uh, over 100 Jews were killed in November 1938. Uh, virtually every synagogue in Germany was burned out. 30,000 were put in, Jews were put in concentration camps. Incidentally, Jews who were Zionists were almost immediately released. Uh, and as a result of that, and because of the worldwide uproar, the Conservative government did the first decent thing it had ever done, and probably ever will do, which was to agree a scheme called the Kinder Transport, whereby 10,000 Jewish children from Germany, or the Greater Germany, because of course they'd already invaded Czechoslovakia, were able to come to Britain and thereby escape, because they were, most, if not all of them, would have died uh, in the extermination camps or as part of the Holocaust. And what was the reaction of the Zionists to this? You might think that uh, uh, they would have welcomed this, but no, on the contrary, they were furious. Weizmann, Chaim Weizmann, the first Israeli president and then president of the Zionist organization, and David Ben-Gurion, who was the first prime minister and then chair of the Jewish agency, reacted bitterly to this. And Ben-Gurion, in a speech to the Central Committee of the Israeli Labour Party, MAPAI, on the 9th of December 1938, explained his reasoning. And it was this, he said, if I knew that it would be possible to save all the children in Germany by bringing them over to England, and only half of them by transporting them to Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, then I would opt for the second alternative. For we, we must weigh not only the life of these children, but also the history of the people of Israel. People of Israel is in capital letters. I mean, that was his obsession. That was the project summed up. It was to recreate what, in the mythology of Zionism, was the people of Israel. And I, I think that really sums up the whole, if you like, the, the ideology and the idea behind uh, the state of Israel today. That, that, in a sense, uh, was uh, what it was there for. And, uh, 
uh, and in a memorandum uh, to the Zionist executive of the 17th of December, that is just a week after uh, 1938, he said, uh, and he expressed his fears and his worries and the worries of the Zionist uh, movement. He said, if the Jews are faced with a choice between the refugee problem and rescuing Jews from concentration camps on the one hand, an aid for the National Museum in Palestine on the other, the Jewish sense of pity will prevail and our people's entire strength will be directed to the aid for the refugees in the various countries. Zionism will vanish from the agenda and the, indeed not only world public opinion in England and America, but also from Jewish, from Jewish public opinion. We are risking Zionism's very existence if we allow the refugee problem to be separated from the Palestine problem. And that summed up, in a sense, everything about the Zionist attitude during the Holocaust. They fought bitterly against any rescue schemes because in their view, to simply rescue Jews uh, was a palliative. They brought anti-Semitism with them. Anti-Semitism was something they carried with them because don't forget, in the Zionist eyes, anti-Semitism wasn't a product of the society people live in, but it was a virus, it was a disease, and they would simply carry it with them to some other country. The answer had to be a fundamental solution, which in his eyes, and the Zionist leadership's eyes, was the establishment of a separate Jewish state. So I, I, I can't stress that enough. And if you like, I'm going to give people some examples of this. Uh, you hear today uh, that Zionism is a virus, it is a disease, uh, very much along the lines of what Pinsker said. For instance, John Jonathan Friedland, who is one of the most notorious Zionist ideologues, in, the letter, in an article in The Guardian, it was entitled, Anti-Semitism Matters, Jews are the canary in the coal mine. In other words, uh, anti-Semitism is what they also call a light sleeper. Uh, anti-Semitism never dies, it cannot be fought. Uh, it is always there and it will arise. And of course, uh, when people criticize Israel, that's when it's at, it is at its most virulent. But if we look at, and I'm just trying to say, I, 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 I'm not sure whether I have any uh... yeah, if I can share, I don't know whether I can share uh, the screen. Uh... Yes, you can. Yeah. Let me know when I you can now. I can now. Okay. Can everyone see this article? No, you haven't. I don't think you've shared it. Haven't I? Oh, oh, I see. Yes, of course. I've got to click on share, haven't I? Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, there we are. Can you see it now? Yes. This was during the Corbyn era, of course, uh, when uh, Friedman was, I would say, the main ideologue uh, of the anti-Semitism campaign. And this was one of a series of articles uh, that he did. Uh, and it was a question of conflating uh, both anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. So the picture is of the Battle of Cable Street, which the Zionists took no part in, uh, and uh, just straightforward conflation. Uh, and there he says, anti-Semitism matters, Jews are the canary in the coal mine. In other words, anti-Semitism is always there. It cannot be fought. I mean, uh, uh, you can end that sharing now or I, I, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. So uh, that, if you like, is the Zionist uh, attitude uh, to anti-Semitism. But when Zionism arose at the end of the 19th century, uh, with its view that Jews did not belong in the diaspora, in the countries that they lived, everywhere amongst Jews, uh, it was seen as a form of Jewish anti-Semitism. Uh, 
and it was a form of Jewish anti-Semitism because it took on board everything the anti-Semite said and simply claimed it as its own. For example, uh, I'll just say what, one other thing. What it sought to do in Palestine was to create the new Jew, the Jewish settler who was tied to the land by blood, uh, etc. It was a blood and soil ideology, very much like European racism and fascism was, uh, the idea of blood and blood. Uh, and, you know, if, if I quoted to you various things that the Zionists said about the Jews in the diaspora, you would almost certainly believe that they came from anti-Semites, for example, and I, I, I'll give you just a few quotes. Pinchas Rosenblatt, uh, who was the first Israeli minister of justice and a liberal minister at that, he described Palestine as an institute for the fumigation of Jewish vermin. Joseph Sprinzak, Sprinzak uh, the first speaker of the Knesset, spoke of the new German Im immigrants as a great deal of filth in the Yeshuv, the Yeshuv being the Jewish community in Palestine. Uh, and that's from, uh, I think, Christopher Sykes. No, no, sorry, uh, Christopher Sykes is a different quote. Uh, there was Jacob Klatskin, uh, who was a key Zionist theoretician. He edited uh, their paper developed from 1909 to 1911 and then helped form the Encyclopedia Judaica. And he wrote of a people disfigured in both body and soul, in a word of a horror, some sort of outlandish creature, in any case, not a pure national type, some sort of oddity amongst the people going by the name of Jew. Uh, and you can find that and much else besides in Arthur Hertzberg book, The Zionist Idea. And Joachim Doron, uh, it, it, in a, a key essay uh, in the Journal of Israeli His History called Classic Zionism and Its Enemies, had commented about these quotes. And he said, rather than take up arms against the enemies of the Jews, Zionism attacked the enemy within the diaspora Jew himself, and subjected him to a hail of criticism. Indeed, the perusal of Zionist sources reveals criticism as so scathing that the generation that witnessed Auschwitz has difficulty comprehending them. Say so he's an Israeli political scientist, and this is in probably the most prestigious journal uh, of uh, Zionism, the Journal of Israeli History. So. I say, I, I'm simply quoting uh, from him, but that was the Zionist idea that it was a, a feeling of utter contempt uh, for diaspora jury. And indeed that pers persisted towards the Holocaust victims themselves. When they came to Israel, they were treated with contempt. The name for them was Sapon, soap, based on the popular myth that the fat of those who had been gassed was turned into soap. It was a myth but it was a very popular myth, especially in Poland. That was the attitude to the, uh, the Jews, the Holocaust. Indeed, I would say that that attitude has not changed particularly. Uh, the prosecutor, Gideon Hausner, at the Eichmann trial, spoke of uh, quite witheringly of the Jews of the Holocaust uh, who died in the Holocaust, having gone like sheep to the slaughter. Uh, there was a feeling that here we were, we were the new Israelis. We were the ones who stand and fight, unlike the diaspora Jews who simply gave in to anti-Semitism. So, I mean, that, I say, is current even today because although Israel makes a great deal of the Holocaust and it's attempted, as we know, uh, with Gaza on October the 7th to pretend that this is a recurrence of the ancient Jewish po anti-Jewish pogroms, that it's the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust and so on. In reality, uh, their attitude to the Holocaust survivors was, was one of contempt. And you see that in the fact that even today, I mean, the surviving Holocaust survivors who live in Israel, over one third of them live in poverty. They have to choose between uh, heating and eating. 
uh, and it's not as if Israel isn't a rich country. I mean, it can, it has the second highest expenditure on arms per capita in the world. I think Saudi Arabia is the highest, but uh, anyway, uh, it, it's not that Israel lacks the money, it's that they are not a priority. So the Holocaust is a very useful ideological weapon, but uh, it's actually really nothing to do with the Holocaust when it comes down to it. I just want to really comment on anti-Semitism itself and uh, in relation to what Abraham Leon said about Zionism transposing it to all of history. I mean, the Zionists start off with the myth of the, the expulsion of Jews from uh, Palestine uh, around the time of Christ, 70 AD, the fall of the, of the Second Temple. I mean, this is a myth, and uh, uh, there are no historical sources that they, uh, that uh, substantiate this. On the contrary, Jews in Palestine, or the Hebrews, quite freely emigrated uh, to the neighboring Hellenized cities for a very simple reason, the land could not support them. And they were not uh, the only ones. The Phoenicians uh, had also been a, a great trading uh, nation. Uh, and similarly, the Jews in Palestine, uh, or the majority of them, emigrated quite freely uh, to cities like Alexandria, which contained over a million Jews at the time. Uh, and so they, they took up, bearing in mind that these were the time pre-capitalist times, they were what uh, Leon called the agents of the money within an, an economy that was not based on money. And of course, uh, in an economy based on use values, people who dealt, who traded, dealt in money and so on, were resented. It was called usury. Uh, and that wasn't just true of, uh, of Jewish people. Uh, I mean, the Chinese were called the Jews of Southeast Asia because they fulfilled a similar role, as did other people. So anti-Semitism had key material and economic roots. And you see the same in Europe. Uh, the Jews fulfilled certain roles, whether it was money lenders, tax stewards, uh, and so on, in feudal Europe. And when capitalism developed in Western Europe, uh, they emigrated to Eastern Europe, where they fulfilled exactly the same roles. So the antagonism to Jews, which we call anti-Semitism, was in, in fact very much an economic antagonism. It had material roots, and that has to be distinguished from modern anti-Semitism. And the key difference is this, that anti-Semitism in those times came from the lower orders, from the peasants, from uh, the lower clergy, the mendicants and so on. Whereas anti-Semitism in the modern times has come from the ruling classes and from the state. Tsarist Russia, where von Plev, Herzl's friend incidentally, uh, created the Black Hundreds in order to instigate uh, pogroms against the Jews of uh, Tsarist Russia. We know for certain, of course, uh, in Nazi Germany that uh, anti-Semitism came from the state, from the Nazi party uh, and the ruling classes. It didn't come uh, from the working classes. I mean, there is a myth uh, which is current in Germany because I've taught German students that anti-Semitism came from the, from the lower classes from the working classes but this is simply not true uh, if you look at the two elections in november 1932 the communists and the socialists got well in july uh, something like 11 and a half million votes uh the nazis i think got about 13 million but then in november 32 it was reversed the communists and the socialists gained about 13 million and the nazi vote fell by about one and a half million and, and this was the primary reason why the ruling class in Germany panicked and put Hitler in power, because they feared that the Nazis were losing support. Uh, and the Nazis were seen by the German ruling class, and not just by them, but by Churchill, Lloyd George and others, uh, as, if you like, the antidote uh, to the communists, to the working classes and the working class organisations. So, Anti-Semitism fulfilled a very specific social role in Germany, and not only just in Germany, 
Uh, the same was true in Poland and elsewhere. And Tom mentioned about ethnic states uh, and the Jewish state. What's wrong with Israel is not that it, Judaism might be the national religion, of course. I mean, we have that in Britain. We have a national religion. I mean, hardly anyone adheres to it. But the point in Britain, which is nominally a Christian country with the queen as the head of the church or the king now, isn't it? Yes. Uh, is that my rights as someone who is Jewish do not depend on whether I am a Christian or not. Uh, we are all equal under the law, some more equal than others maybe, but uh, there is an equality under the law. In Israel, that is not the case. And that was also the case in Europe, in Eastern Europe, a whole series of ethno-Christian states like Romania, Hungary, Croatia, Slovakia, were actually the eager participants in the Holocaust. Uh, I often quote Governor Hans Frank, the Nazi governor of Poland or the general government, because uh, uh, large parts of it were annexed, when he said of Romania that uh, we practice surgery, they practice butchery, because the, the pogroms in Romania were quite horrific. Uh, and of course, again, they came from the ruling class uh, primarily. So. The point I, I, I'm making about anti-Semitism is simply that uh, in the modern era, it has been a weapon of the ruling class. Uh, the, met, the first, the founder of political Zionism was a, a guy called Theodore Herzl, and he wrote this. It's a founding pamphlet. It was published in 1896. I don't know whether you can see it or not. The Jewish State. Uh, and it's quite interesting because... In 1896, Herzl was a journalist for the Viennese paper, the New Free Press, and he was in Paris. Uh, and anyone who knows their history will, of course, know that the Dreyfus affair uh, was the major anti uh, major uh, fight back against anti-Semitism uh, in uh, the 19th century. The, a Jewish captain had been accused of treason, wrongly convicted, Crowds and mobs outside his military trial shouted death to the Jews, etc. So this was, if you like, the currency of debate within Europe. France was divided massively. Uh, Jacques was uh, the famous uh, slogan that uh, came. And yet Herzl in this pamphlet says absolutely nothing. He doesn't even mention Dreyfus although the myth is that Herzl's Zionism came about as a result of the Dreyfus trial. Uh, if I had time, uh, I would go through uh, this pamphlet, but uh, there's one or two things I would like to quote because I, I think it, it bears, it, it helps explain the Zionist attitude to anti-Semitism. And he said, where it does not exist, this is page 14, that is anti-Semitism, it is carried by Jews in the course of their migrations. We naturally move to those places where we are not persecuted, and there our presence produces persecution. In other words, as I have mentioned previously, anti-Semitism was in essence a virus, and it could not be conquered. And elsewhere in his pamphlet, I mean, uh, I really do recommend anyone who's interested in Zionism should read it uh, because it is fascinating. He said, in the principal countries where anti-Semitism prevails, it does so as a result of the emancipation of the Jews, uh, which was nonsense, of course. Emancipation hadn't taken place in Tsarist Russia and anti-Semitism was strongest there. But Zionism hated uh, uh, emancipation. Incidentally, much of the Orthodox Jews did as well. And the reason why was simple. Zionism welcomed uh, the formation of the, and the existence of the Jewish ghettos because it kept Jews together. The problem with emancipation was it gave them equal rights and they could intermingle with the non-Jews. And then, of course, you had intermarriage. And in Germany, in the beginning of the last century, uh, over 50% of German Jews had married out. And this desire was anathema because they wanted to preserve the Jewish people, not to see them mingle and assimilate amongst the non-Jews. So, I mean, Zionism always had that incredibly reactionary uh, politics. 
about it. it it resented, if you like, those who fought anti-Semitism more than the anti-Semites themselves. I've probably gone on long enough now, I think. So I'm going to terminate and no doubt we'll have a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, comrades, if you have questions or would like to make a contribution, please click um, raise hand, which is under uh, reactions or is just at the bottom of your screen. Tom, did you want to come back to something before we open? The discussion. Uh, sure. J just quickly, uh, 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 Tony, I take your point about the word anti-Semitism. I'm not convinced, but I, I take your point uh, about Jewish identity. I'm glad you point that out because I must be more clear. I completely agree with you. My use of the word, I mean it as each individual person is being robbed of their individual self-identity by Zionism. I didn't mean it as a as the Jews, uh, but I'm glad you pointed that out because I will be more careful. The issue of uh, my claim that the crime of the Palestinians is that they are not Jewish, I still stand by my point because the fact is that the Jewish Palestinians were welcomed and the remainder, by definition, they were not going to be receptive to being ruled by the Zionists. So this was a no-win situation. Even if the even if the remainder had wanted to convert and they were, the Zionists were, were receptive to this conversion, it could have never worked. It, the actual problem was that they were not Jewish when the Zionists got there. Uh, so I, I still stand by that, but I uh, appreciate your comment on it. Thank you. Thank you. Tony, do you want to reply or shall we? Uh, just very briefly, uh, there is actually an article. Uh, I don't know when I can dig it up. It actually helps explain my point in a sense, but uh, I may not be able to dig it up. You could always post it in chat if, if you yeah, um, can find it now. I mean, the, the point I'm making is that if anyone was descended from the ancient Hebrews, it wasn't the European settlers who came claiming they were Jewish. It was the Palestinians themselves. Uh, those Palestinians, uh, those Jews who didn't convert uh, to Islam or Christianity, and of course most Jews did in the Holy Land, uh, were the, in fact, indeed, most most Jews did convert to Christianity and then Islam, but they, they were the original, if you like, Jews uh, who'd always resided in Palestine. Uh, and, and Ben Gurion and Yitzhak Ben Tzvi, who was the second Israeli president, recognized this. So uh, it, it was, to it was to a totally bogus concept to begin with. It, it really had, I don't think, anything to do with uh, being Jewish. I mean, amongst the Palestinians, a lot of customs uh, survived uh, into uh, the last century, such as lighting candles on a Friday night, which is a Jewish tradition. But of course, it wasn't about uh, who was and who wasn't Jewish. It was that Zionism was a white settler uh, colonization. And, it, uh, and they only latterly brought over, incidentally, uh, the Arab Jews, because the Holocaust had wiped out the reservoirs of Jewry in Eastern Europe. I mean, when when Arthur Rupin, who was, I would say, the most important pre-state Zionist figure, who, who was director of the Palestine office, uh, when they needed hard work to be done in the kibbutzim and the settlements, he brought over the Yemenite Jews. But for him, they weren't real Jews. Uh, and the conditions they experienced, uh, they were paid much lower wages, they didn't receive medical care and so on. Uh, it was what uh, Etan Bloom, in a very interesting PhD from Tel Aviv University, described as pathological stereotyping. Something like 50% of them died as a result of this. So Zionism was uh, an inherently racist European settler phenomena. Uh, I, I think we should bear that in mind. Of course, they had to bring the Arab Jews over. In fact, they destabilized their position in the Arab countries. Uh, as a result of the Nakba and other activities that I don't have time to go into now. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you very much both. I mean, clearly it's a subject and we've had lots of uh, questions in the in the chat, etc., which is hugely complicated. And as Tony and, and both Tom said, has gone through changes a lot. You know, things change all the time. Antisemitism is being redefined. All the more important that, you know, things like zero tolerance on issues like antisemitism or bigotry are uh, totally the wrong approach, aren't they? I mean, Tom, you you quite rightly, you know, you you explained at the beginning that it is the you the, the Israeli state saying the Jews, the Jews are this, the Jews are that. And then somebody does it on the internet, and uh, that makes you an anti-Semite, you know. And you know, we have to explain to comrades, we have to be able to have discussions and explain what is anti-Semitism and what it is. But you're yeah, quite right. Uh, we should we should go on the offensive, you know, if you're if you are being accused of being a, an anti-Semite, you should be pointing out that you're in solidarity with the Palestinians, etc. Comrades, if you want to come in and have a question, please click raise hand or put your question in the Q&A. There are questions in the Q&A at the moment, which are sort of, you know, the, the future of, of the current situation that is important as well. But I think perhaps we could at the moment uh, look at the, the his, history. Um, Malcolm, I think you have a you have a question. You're now you can speak now. Malcolm? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question. I, I, I suppose it's related, but it's to do with the scheme that they had at the beginning, I think, of the 40s, which was called the Millions Scheme, whereas in, uh, in Palestine, the Zionists realised they hadn't got enough people and they could sort of hoover up Jews from the sort of, I, could, I suppose you call it, North Africa or, or Arab areas. And which I think they did quite successfully. But the only thing I really read about it was in uh, Mr. Swarish's book, where he says that in Iraq, the Zionists did a sort of false flag uh, um, <clears throat> scheme to sort of frighten Jews to think that they were actually being attacked, whereas in fact they were being attacked by Zionists. And uh, this, of course, is to do with all Jews having to be in the state of Israel. But I was just wondering how much intimidation there were in other areas, because there were there were people called Jews in Syria, Iraq, in Egypt, in Tunisia, and, and the whole whole area. So I, I wondered if one of the speakers would be able to say a little bit about that. I'd be most interested. Thank you very much. Either of you um, has got anything to say on that? Uh, I don't know specifically about North Africa, but uh, according to uh, British archives, according to their quotes, uh, that when they had spies in the uh, Jewish agency meetings, the Jewish agency did start programs in Northern Africa to uh, stir the bees nest to to um, through a, a matter of some limited false flags operations and through the um, it just rumors of trouble that you're not safe over there to force people to leave um there's in the immediate post statehood period there is a book by hannah braun called weeds don't perish to that effect uh, she was in the haganah and she was one of the people who received the people who uh, had been received uh, who had been through intimidation had left Northern Africa. And what happened is that when they left off, uh, uh, Northern Africa, their citizenship in those countries was immediately forfeited. And at the same time, Israel imposed uh, unpayable tariffs for leaving Israel. So they were prisoners there. And uh, there's uh, uh, there was even a group named, naming itself after an, a United States uh, Black Liberation Group, the Black Panthers, that that fought against this, but they uh, they were at that point stranded in the Israeli state. So yes, there was a lot of push out of North Africa, and um, there was a lot of resentment on the part of, I don't know how many, but a good percentage of those people. Once they reached Israel, they were treated as second-class citizens. They were uh, unlike the Ashkenazi Jews, they were treated with DDT. They were put in the border areas so that they would take the brunt of any attacks from the um, 
from the Jordanian West Bank and the Egyptian Gaza Strip. Um, and uh, they, they were put into the military, whereas an Ashazi Jew was more likely just to be given a house and given a job. So they faced a lot of discrimination when they came. And this, of course, does, uh, does tie into what uh, Tony was saying about the racism within, within Jewish identity of the Israeli state. Uh, Tony, anything? Well, the most famous case, of course, and the best documented is the Iraqi Jewish community. Uh, the Iraqi Jewish community was the oldest Jewish community in the world. It was, there are two Talmuds, codes of uh, Jewish law. Uh, one is uh, the Jerusalem Talmud and the other is the Babylonian Talmud. And it is the Babylonian Talmud which takes precedence. Uh, and in 1950-51, the Zionist underground in Iraq, uh, which had plenty of weapons, uh, it could supply a company of soldiers, uh, it deliberately set about planting bombs or throwing bombs at Jewish targets, cafes and synagogues and other places in order to simulate the appearance of anti-Semitism. And they did a deal with the ruler, the then ruler, Nouri A. Syed. Uh, basically, it was that Israel wanted the bodies of, uh, of uh, the Iraqi Jewish community and in exchange, the Iraqi state would keep their wealth because they were an extremely wealthy Jewish community. Uh, one third of Baghdad, more than one third, was Jewish. Uh, the Minister of Finance was Jewish, uh, etc. But there's a very good book which has just come out by Avi Schleim, who's a professor or was a professor of international relations at Oxford called Three Worlds, precisely about his background and how he came as a young child to Israel and then emigrated to England. Uh, and he goes into this in some detail. And he also digs up new evidence as to who planted the bomb at the Masud Shentov synagogue, which was the key bomb that led to the exodus of most of the Jewish community. But basically, Israel, together with the Iraqi regime at the time, conspired that Israel would get the Jews and Ira the, the Iraqi state would keep their wealth. So, as Tom says, when they came to Israel, they were showered with a pesticide, DDT, on their arrival. And they were treated really a uh, little better than vermin. They were put into these tent encampments and then sent out to uh, the outposts. Uh, they were really not considered full human beings or full Jews for that matter. And that explains the, the, the base of Likud, because when Menachem Begin won the 1977 election, it was on the basis of the complete alienation of the Mizrahi Jews the East, uh, the Eastern Jews uh, in Israel. So yes, I mean, Zionism has also been racist towards uh, its own Jews, but the, the problem with the Mizrahi or the Sephardi Jews is they're very much like the poor white trash uh, of the Deep South, that they're, they're even more racist than their Ashkenazi neighbors because the, the, they see the Arabs. I mean, they've been assimilated to, to Israeli Jewish culture. It's taken a time. Uh, but, you know, Arabic was forbidden almost. It was a social taboo for them to speak in public. But uh, they have become the base of the racist uh, mobs in Israel today. A couple of questions in the... Oh, sorry, Tom, did you want to say something? Uh, uh, yes, just a, uh, a comment, uh, because I think it's very little known. Uh, Zionists, of course, contest the idea that the Israeli state had anything to do with the ethnic cleansing of Jews from Iraq. The to me, aside from the vast evidence in, that, that proves this, there's a very interesting aspect about the airline that was given the contract to bring the Jews from Iraq by way of Cyprus and then to Israel. They couldn't go directly. Uh, and this airline was called Near East Air Transport. It was invented for the purpose. It was it appeared to be owned by Alaska Airlines but it was actually an Israeli airline. Now, the key point of it is this. It had two small planes. These two small planes were completely unable to keep up with the, the number of 
people that had already forfeited their homes and their wealth and were literally homeless, hungry, and cold, on even on the runway, and unable to leave because these two planes could not keep up with the exodus. Now, this puts the Israeli apologists in a very strange position because they either have to agree that, yes, Israel was behind the bombings, and therefore they knew that there was no mortal threat against these people, and therefore they could take their time getting them out, or they have to say that, yes, it was the... Um, the Arabs that were doing this, the Jews were at, they were about to have their throats slashed, and yet we refused to let any other country help us get them out. We made them stay there at the mercy of these so-called Arabs. You have to take your poise, your your choice of this. In other words, with when you add in the aspect of Near East air transport. Israel's apologists are actually better off saying, yes, we planted the bombs, because that's less egregious than saying we didn't, but we left them there to die. Thank you. There's a, a couple of questions in the chat before I bring um, other people in. Um, from Duncan, does, and I think the answer is yes, but uh, maybe a bigger explanation, does Zionism then feed anti-Semitism? And he says sometimes anti-Zionists seem to doubt that. Um, and one other question is, um, Tony mentioned that, you know, anti-Semitism was uh, prevalent somewhat in the in the peasantry longer ago and then was taken over by ruling classes, including in Russia, etc. Um, obviously, we say it's, it's probably not because it's, you know, inherent in everybody, um, but there must have been some political reasons for it. It um, wasn't perhaps. taken over. Anti-Semitism changed. Anti-Semitism amongst the peasants was an economic phenomena. It wasn't because they were Jews, it was because of what Jewish people did, mm -hmm. which I think is an entirely different thing. The anti-Semitism of the modern era is a racial anti-Semitism, which is based on the idea that Jews constitute a separate race. So, for instance, for Martin Luther, who was without doubt anti-Semitic, once a Jew converted, that was it. But for the Nazis, once a Jew, always a Jew. So you had the phenomena in Nazi Germany of Christian Jews. They were still considered Jewish and they still went to the extermination camps. So there was a, a there was a, an absolute break between the two forms of anti-Semitism, which the Zionists, of course, don't recognize. It's one of a continuous, seamless phenomena. Mm. What about this question, anti um is, you know, does Zionism feed anti-Semitism? Yeah, absolutely, yes. yes. I think we've answered that only as the whole session was about that. It associates all Jews with Israel's crimes. How else can it not? Yeah. Uh, I would just add that it feeds anti-Semitism for those who accept anti-Zionism. In other words, it, uh, unless you agree that that Israel's crimes are done by quote unquote the Jews, unless you have to already accept this as valid for it to to feed anti-Semitism. In um in England in the summer of 1947, uh, there were uh terrible pogroms against Jews because of the Irgun hanging of two sergeants in in Palestine. But this had been building up and up and up. Now, in the in the minds of the the racists perpetrating these programs in England, they were simply taking Zionism at, at its word. The the Ergun was saying that we're doing this for uh, in the name of Jews. Now, if in fact you you take them up on that, you're accepting the racism of of the, uh, the Zionist movement, but only if you accept it. Okay, Virginia, please hi. Hi, um, thanks very much for the talks. Um, first of all, I have to say that I don't know, um, you know, one tenth of one percent uh, about uh, the history of Zionism that either um, uh, um, Tony or Tom does. But um, yeah, just a, a one sort of comment and a couple of points beyond that. I mean, Tony, when you're talking about um, Zionism's ambition in um, Israel um, and and expanding. 
even if theoretically <laughs> they were able to kill off all the Palestinians, um, um, th then, I mean, they'd still be surrounded by Arab states. So, um, you know, what, 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 what about that? I mean, how could they expect to survive in that circumstance unless they do regard themselves as sort of, you know, a uh, U.S. attack dog or something like that. But uh, um, another comment on um, what you said about blood and soil. I worked for a while in New York for Ingrid Bergman, um, Ingrid Bergman, Ingrid Warburg, who was uh, the sort of black sheep of the Warburg family, had come over to the States in the 30s to alert people to what was going on, mainly rich Jews. Um, um, in in Europe, but um, and, and I don't think she was a Zionist, but she did say that um, it, that the idea of going to Israel for a lot of Jews was so that they could not, because they had been barred from owning land or obviously centuries ago from joining the guilds. At least in Israel, they could they could do all sorts of occupations. They could be sort of peasant like, or they could be all kinds of things. So it wasn't strictly the sort of blood and soil that comes from having a, a, you know, a homeland of your own sort of thing. So I wonder what you would comment, say about that. And when you were talking about um, uh, anti-Semitism from, from the top phase of anti-Semitism in Germany, I mean, when Jews were able to sort of enter into other occupations, um, then a lot of them fulfilled quite a lot of elite professions and this sort of thing. And I just wonder whether you think there was certainly there would have been resentment um, on either Tony or, or, or Tom of the kind of sort of replacement theory fears that are voiced by white supremacists in in um, uh, you know in the United States, for instance, or elsewhere. Um, so I think that that is the end of what I had to say. Thanks, Thanks Virginia. Um, shall I take somebody else, or do you want to reply, either of you? I can reply briefly. Uh, yep. There's no doubt that in, I mean, Jews were well equipped because of their roles in the feudal era to enter the capitalist era uh, with an advantage uh, in things like business and so on. So they also, if you like, Jews were, and it, this is not unique to Jews, they traveled often with, with what you might say was capital in their heads and they're not the, I say, the only people. So yes, Jews were overrepresented, if you like, in the professions in Germany and also incidentally in Poland. And that caused economic antagonism to them by mainly the petty bourgeois uh, who resented them as economic competitors. But, uh, and that did fuel the, that was the base of the anti-Semitism in most states, but, I should say in Germany, when Hitler came to power, anti-Semitism was declining. Indeed, between 30 and 33, the Nazis barely made any mention of their anti-Semitism. It was their anti-communism that was the main plank of their propaganda. And the reason for that was anti-Semitism was really not seen as respectable at all uh, in Germany. So this idea that, you know, <laughs> It was a war against the Jews, the Nazis, and it was backed by an anti-Semitic German population simply is not borne out. And there, there is really very little disagreement amongst the historians on that fact. Yeah, thank you. Tom, anything? Oh, I just say, I forgot to mention one other thing. When you talked about a Jew is always a Jew, how do you compare that with, you know, the Spanish uh, blood purity thing? You know, well, that was the origin of it in many ways, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Bernie, then, please. Thank you. This uh, kind of relates to what something Virginia brought up about the um, surrounding Arab states. Uh, I'm bringing up more up to date recent uh, developments, um, particularly with the overspill of the conflict into Lebanon. Um, I sent a message to Tony a while ago and um, brought up the topic of anti-Semitism in terms of Islamophobia. 
that um, the, uh, the weaponization of anti-Semitism by the Zionist entity, um, that the this sort of visceral hatred of um, Arabs, which is expressed by the likes of Smotrich and Gallant and Ben Gavir, um, with the comments they've made, which we're familiar with, that um, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Tony or Tom to comment on the implications of this. Um, um, I mean, uh, in his reply to me, um, Tony mentioned that um, this uh, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are more or less two tributaries of the same poison stream, uh, which, of course, um, is racism. So I'd like to um, ask you about what the implications are for uh, the, um, Ar the Arab states surrounding Palestine um, regarding this um, uh, attitude towards um, Arabs which is, you know, quite frankly, is, anti is, is as anti-Semitic as the claims made by those who criticise the Zionist ethno-state. So, I'm afraid any... Tommy had to reboot his computer because the internet was breaking up. Tom, do you have anything to say on that? My comment would be that I don't think this outrageous language by... Uh, by Israeli politicians and government people, it doesn't change anything. It's nothing new. The Israeli state, by its very premise, is playing out the only way it could possibly play out. And whether or not individual uh, government ministers or politicians actually come out and blurt it out, just say it like it is, is irrelevant. It's the same course that Israel has always been on it's the same the only course that a zionist state can be on it requires a so-called racially pure state on as much land as possible which originally meant the the entirety of the biblical land of of um eretz israel which included of course jordan and some surrounding territory but at at this point at present at least uh it is simply river to sea although um with the new pronouncements that uh, Israel will re require security over the entire area makes me think that it's not impossible. They will also go to the east side of the Jordan. But uh, no, to me, I don't see that it's any different than it always has been. And as regards the surrounding Arab states, I think from the beginning, although I think that Israel should never have happened and is an untenable state, if we just put that aside, from the beginning, had there been firm borders, any borders, as long as they were established borders that were defended by the rest of the world, that neither that none of the sides could could uh, could violate, there could have been an unjust peace, an unjust peace in the sense that there would have been peace. It would have been eternally unfair to the native people of of the region, but with borders, this could have been aborted. But there never were borders because Israel has never been willing to settle for any existing frontier. So, for example, the the what we call the provisional borders, what we call the so called nineteen sixty seven borders, are not borders. They never were borders. They were a ceasefire line. The armistice established a ceasefire line, and it was nothing more than that. Israel was supposed to return to the um, partition or Bernadotte's other plan uh, to some allegedly legal border and stay there. But it simply refused, as it simply refused to do everything that it was required to do. So it, even when oh. we talk about the 1967 borders, they are not borders. So I don't see that um, that the language out of uh, Israel's cover current government is is any different except in its honesty. Thank you, um, comrades. We've got quite a few people with their hands up still. Um, so if you could keep yourself relatively short, and I'm not sure if Tony's able to come back in. So Tom, you'll have to. Oh, there he is. There he is. <laughs> 
Okay, Anne, hi. Hi, hi, thank you. Thank you to both speakers. Um, so what I wanted to ask about is this question of weaponizing, weaponization of anti-Semitism by the um, Israeli state. And to ask whether there are any comparisons that could be made that would maybe help in throwing more light on the question. So you could say that there are uh, states and there are states in the world where Islam is the state religion and that it uses Islam in order to um, detract any attention, uh, sorry, any negative attention from a self or order to seal off its population from criticisms of it from the rest of the world. And these people are Islamophobic, et cetera, et cetera. We say Afghanistan. Um, would you also say that by using this religion um, in the way they do to repress people, that they also generate um, Islamophobia? And then the other thing is like, if you think about how the Soviet Union was after 28, I would say 1928, where Marxism was weaponized as a way to perpetuate the existence of what something which wasn't socialism. Um, so, you know, it's just like, I think that it, the question should be asked, is this something that happens, that has happened and continues to happen in different forms? Or are you arguing that this is something particular to Israel? And then the, the second very short um, point I wanted to make is because I've been trying to educate myself a bit more and I've been looking at documentaries and there's a recent documentary called The Settlers, which showed that they, some of the older settlers, you know, the settlements in the West Bank do definitely see themselves as being part of some biblical you know, um, retaking of biblical lands that really belong to them and see it in those terms. But that very many of the younger ones, and that's even, you know, among the settlers, weren't particularly religious, but they have this kind of, um, how would I describe it, a kind of a, like an uh, outward bound, but with a rat rifle attitude of, you know, the, the natives are down there and we rule, a kind of a... a, a uh, patriotism and this Israeli patriotism that I wouldn't describe as being religious. That's all. Thank you, Tina. Thank you. Anybody wants to reply to that? Or we could well, get one more question, perhaps. I, I'm quite happy to. Uh, I think the best example of what Anne says is in where she comes from, Ireland. The Protestants did exactly that. Uh, they set up Protestant, a Protestant supremacist state, and that was also based around religion. Uh, and again, that was really a, a racial phenomena. Uh, so, I mean, it's ha I don't think that the way the Soviet Union used Marxism can be compared. It's not racial in any sense. Uh, it's ideological and political. So, uh, yes, I mean, certainly uh, Zionism isn't unique in that. In the West Bank, I mean, there's a fusion of the religious messianism with the settler colonialism. So that is what they've really substituted. I mean, a very interesting religious philosopher who's died, Yesh Yeshiyahu Leibovich, uh, termed them uh, Judeo-Nazis. He was a professor uh, uh, at the Hebrew University. Uh, he, he refused the Israel Prize, in fact. Uh, and he pointed out that they substituted worship of the land for the worship of God. But uh, the religious nationalists, uh, again, have changed the religion itself. Let me give it a very simple example. There are notices at the entrance to the Temple Mount, uh, where Al-Aqsa is based, saying that religious Jews must not enter because it's forbidden for a Jew to enter the Holy of Holies, which is where the high priests used to converse with God, apparently. Uh, but the religious nationalists uh, disregard that uh, because they want to conquer Al-Aqsa and resurrect the Third Temple and reinstigate animal sacrifices and all the rest of it. So uh, religion is a very malleable thing and it changes. 
Uh, it too is not fixed, like identity is not fixed. It changes with time. So there's always that disjunction between uh, traditional Orthodox Judaism, even of the Zionist nature, like Agudat Yisrael, which is represented in the Knesset and is still officially not Zionist, although in practice it is. And the religious nationalists for whom uh, religion is simply the ideology of uh, the settler colonial. From the, uh, just reinforcing what Tony said, from the very beginning, of uh, the Zionist movement to settle Palestine, uh, there was always this push to create messianic imagery, to create this, uh, to use Palestine as this great stage for uh, recreating the um, the idea of ancient Israel and that Jews, by virtue of being Jews, are its people. The, uh, there's a, a, an oft-repeated quote from uh, Ilan Pape uh, to the effect of, most Zionists are atheists, but they believe God gave them the land. Uh, it's it's always been like that. The um, every aspect of the Zionist project was creating the this scenario of a return, and that affects regardless of whether a person was overtly religious or passively religious, or even not religious at all. It was still this idea of a return to this uh, imaginary biblical land. Mm -hmm. Ian, please. Oh, sorry. Did I cut somebody off? No. Ian. I was just, I was, I was just going to remark that uh, religious oh. students... No, 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 hold on. Ian's turn is, sorry. Uh, good evening, colleagues. I, I just wanted to ask a question about what happened to the wrong sort of Jews. Um, this phenomenon that we've we've seen, you know, when Corbyn was leading the Labour Party of um, anti-Zionist Jewish people just being regarded as, as the wrong sort of Jew, that somehow they weren't Jewish enough because they didn't support Israel. From a well, I mean, I would have thought that quite a lot of people who had emigrated to Palestine as possibly the only place they could get into at around 1933 or in the run up to that. I mean, I was struck by. Um, in Ilan Papi's book, uh, The Ethnic Cleansing of, Israel, of Palestine, where he was talking about uh, various kibbutzim that had been established and had really fairly convivial relations with uh, Arab uh, villages nearby. Uh, and in fact, uh, had, you know, had, um, there was even a kind of a, a, a tacit agreement, as it were, that, that, that they the, the, the Arab villages would be safe. And what seems to have destroyed any kind of trust and relationship between um, uh, Jews and, 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 and Palestinians um, was the actions of the, the, the various Zionist militias, the Urgun and the Haganah and, the, and uh, above all, Lehi. Now, uh, uh, Lehi were particularly extraordinary, weren't they? Because they actually argued eff effectively that a, a, a Nazi victory would be in Zionism's best interests, and then uh, subsequent, didn't they subsequently style themselves as national Bolsheviks or something? Anyway, what, what was getting to was what became of all of those Jews who must have been pretty left wing, uh, but had to get out of Germany, had to get out of Austria, had to get out of Poland, uh, ended up in Palestine because maybe that's the only place they could get to, and and had been having convivial. Uh, uh, neighbourly kind of relations with Arabs. What happened to them? Were they just simply exterminated? Were they driven underground? What what, what happened? I, I appreciate there's a whole sorry history as well of the um, Israeli Communist Party effectively having an ignoble uh, role that they played in um, getting arms uh, for the Zionists from Czechoslovakia and beyond. Um, I just wonder what happened to all those wrong sort of Jews that were in, in Palestine at the time. Hmm. Interesting. Who wants to go first? Tom? The, uh, to me, the key issue is whether people go to Palestine or any other land as immigrants in the true sense of the world, a word or as usurpers. And the Zionist project required that they go not as immigrants in the true sense, but as usurpers of the land, the extra nationalization of the land. So 
ex with the exception of some people, and there were some people who fled Nazi Germany for various reasons, uh, including the shenanigans of the Zionists, the only place they could get to was Palestine. And they were fine, but they nonetheless were in this system. The Even a lot of the uh, settlements where in theory they had amicable relationships, ultimately the uh, the labor was racialized and ultimately uh, Palestinians were uprooted not overtly with uh, by being physically forced out but because their only means of making a living were denied them and this became quite violent as time went on when i say violent i mean that jews who tried to for example hire non-jews so-called arabs tried to hire them, they, the Jews hiring the Arabs, would be attacked. And Tony, I'm sure, has much to add to that. I cover this to some extent in my in a chapter in my own book on uh, Zionism and socialism. Uh, I mean, just very briefly, the, the difference was between the first Aliyah, the wave of emigration from 1882 to 1904, which was a traditional capitalist colonial emigration, whereby the planters employed Arab labor. Uh, the land was brought up by the Palestine Colonization Association, which had been set up by, I think it was Baron Morris Hirsch. Uh, and then the labor Zionist colonization of 1904 to 1914, which campaigned, as did the history later, for Jewish labor, and it was a campaign for Jewish labor, which meant an exclusion of Arab labor. That was the key uh, point. So, for instance, the Histadrut, which was founded in 19 1920, the so-called trade union, consciously broke up the mixed Arab Jewish union, trade union, the rail workers union, because Ben Gurion and the labor Zionists set their face against joint Arab Jewish working class unity. And this came out at the 1906 Powell Zion Conference, where those who came over, I mean, many of them did have socialist ideas and who argued they should work with Arabs and campaign. And Ben Gurion was adamantly opposed to this because, of course, who was funding the settlement? But Jewish capitalists abroad. Uh, and so the idea of waging class struggle was totally anathema. So he coined the slogan from class to nation. In other words, the class struggle was transmuted into a national struggle against the Arabs. And that was a key point, that Zionism was always fiercely anti-communist. And the, there were many struggles. I mean, there's the struggle of the Gudud Avada, the work gangs in the 1920s, and some of the northern kibbutzim, which did believe in an Arab... I mean, some of them were anti-Zionist, uh, and they were hounded out of Palestine, for example. Uh, and it, there's quite a bit of that in... Zev Sternhall, who was a, a Holocaust survivor, a famous professor at the Hebrew University, is founding myths of Zionism. Uh, I, it's a book I actually uh, recommend. It's the most detailed history of, uh, of labor Zionism in Palestine, which destroys a lot of the myths of that the labor Zionist movement. So uh, anyone who's got time on their hands, it's a detailed book, but it's well worth reading. Fascinating, thank you. Um, Duncan, you're next. No, no I, just going back a bit, I, I, I was um, going to say something about the way in which religious Jewry, uh, both uh, observant and reformed, for a long time was hostile to Zionism. Mm -hmm. you know, when you hear when you hear chief rabbis say that it's anti-Semitic uh, to criticise Zionism, well, most of the uh, earlier chief rabbis were anti-Semitic. Uh, you know, because um, uh, Zionism was perceived as a secular movement uh, posing as an alternative focus for Jewish identity um, uh, instead of Judaism. And uh, today, I mean, the small groups like the Natura Carta uh, who are, uh, have their own passports, although they live in Jerusalem, uh, that they represent really the, the earlier um, uh, Jewish tradition in, in terms of uh, not seeing uh, Palestine as uh, the, the, uh, uh, the colonization of Palestine as uh, divine will, but rather 
as um, a, a kind of blasphemy because they're waiting for the Messiah to come to do that. Thank you. Because we're running a bit short of time, I'm going to ask uh, Steve now in as well to ask his question, then you can reply to both. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Tom and Tony. Um, I, I have some sympathy. I think I wouldn't dismiss it to Tom's the point that Tom made at the beginning, um, which is that we need to think hard about terminology because it's quite confusing the terms. Now, the question of whether we should use the word anti-Jewish as opposed to anti-Semitic, I think is worth a consideration. Because what we're trying to get over is to make it clear to people what we're talking about. Now, again, I don't have a definitive view on that, but I can see that, the way, that we should not be closed to the idea of thinking in, the, in this ideological battle that's going over, the meaning of anti-Semitism, trying to get over to people what it really means as opposed to the misleading ways in which it's being put over. We have to think is what is the best terms, best words to describe that. So I am sympathetic to the point that Tom made. I'm not sure if it's right, by the way. I just, I just I'm sympathetic to us thinking about it. Um, I would also say that um, if you think about it, anti-Semitism meant hostility to Jews, but with the, the creation of the State of Israel after 1948 then, they're trying to define hostility to Israel, as Israel is the collective Jew, as it were, that being hostile to Israel is therefore anti-Semitic. So they have, after 1948, changed the definition of anti-Semitism. To, to mean something other than what we would have thought it was before the existence of the State of Israel. Um, there is another term where the word Semite means kind of, is a kind of racial, a term for Arabs and Jews from the Middle East. So you, one might argue then that the term anti-Semitism meant hostility to Arabs, Palestinians. So in a way, Israel was being anti-Semitic in the way it is treating the um, Palestinian Arabs. So, I mean, I'm not saying I go with that, but I mean, the word Semite also meant something else. Anyway, um, my other point, I think, is to also think about, which has, which has come up, about the social function, that um, rather than race or ethnicity, so the social function of anti-Semitism was, was coming from above by the ruling class, by those in power who want to divide the working class want to divide the democratic movement, and that was the case in Tsarist Russia. It was the case in, Weim, in the Weimar Republic, in Republican France, and, the, and, and, and in Britain. So the, the function, so in a sense, um, anti-Semitism had a function to keep the working class divided. And in that sense, you could imagine that um, the word Jew doesn't necessarily mean a racial term, it's anybody who fulfills that function in in our societies but playing that particular role um so in that sense jews might be a metaphor for those people in our society like um muslims for example that might be playing that function for the to keep people divided um, i'm quickly going to bring in abraham as well because he makes a really good point in the chat um about the i'd like to bring your attention to the uh to what I saw of the libertarian uh, position, which is now adopted an anti-Zionist position, but uses it to blast the Jewish people as a whole and say that, you know, oh, well, you know, like Jewish people, you know, like we're oppressed. Yes, but now we know why. As if it was the Holocaust was the Jewish people's own fault. This is where it's going. And there has to be a discourse which blocks that, which takes the position of the Jewish people who are not Zionist and counterposes, you know, the majority of Jewish people who don't even live in the state of Israel, don't have a vote, and are not responsible, you know, for the supposed claim of that government to be a Jewish state and, and speaking on behalf of the Jewish people. Very essential point to be made. Thank you. Tom, you're muted. Tom. Uh, who is saying this? I'm sorry, I didn't catch. Netanyahu claims to be speaking on behalf of all the Jewish people, of course. Right. But you said the Without, libertarians, that's why. Yes, the libertarians are using, you know, this, you know, newly popular anti-Zionist position, position to blame the Jewish people for our own oppression and saying that oh, this 
phenomenon of Zionism is characteristic of all Jewish people. But, but who said, you say that where libertarian position? Yes, libertarian, which is very where? popular in the United States. In other words, oh, you know, the, the United Trump States. movement. Yeah, and elsewhere. Okay. Yeah. No, I confess I know nothing about that. I will look look at that. Oh yeah, it's very problematic. Uh -huh. You know, anti-Zionism is not a virtue in and of itself. <laughs> it depends on what kind of anti-Zionist position you're taking. Shall I bring in a few more questions from the floor, and then you could perhaps sum it I think up? We've got three at the moment. Should we deal yeah, with okay. those three? Go on, before, yeah, go on. Otherwise, I'll forget them. I don't know yeah. about Tom. Uh, I don't agree with uh, with Abraham. Uh, I think uh, anti-Zionism is quite clearly understood, and I don't think there are varieties other than religious anti-Zionism and secular anti-Zionism, but I, I think they're quite clear. I mean, I take the, uh, the position of uh, the prophet Jeremiah. I, uh, I castigate the Jewish people, those in the diaspora who don't speak out against Zionism, given that Zionism speaks in their name and claims them as its adherents, do also bear a culpability. I don't, I don't accept that, uh, oh, well, you can't, uh, you can't expect Jews in the diaspora or in outside Israel uh, to necessarily condemn what Israel does. I say, yes, you can do that because when someone speaks in your name, you have a duty to say, no, you don't. And that, uh, to me, is the problem. Uh, as regards Duncan's point, I mean, I, I agree with it. Uh, when Zionism came on the scene, then all Jewish religious trends from reform to orthodox opposed it. In 1888, the famous Pittsburgh Declaration, the Reform Jury, said we are not a people. Uh, we, we, we are part of the nations amongst whom we live. Uh, and, and they were very much opposed I mean, to Zionism today. Of course, reform jury has fallen into the same traps in a sense. I mean, I can give you, I mean, uh, when I say that Zionism is a form of Jewish anti-Semitism, we were seen as that. I mean, I can quote Sir Samuel Montague, who was an, a liberal MP in the beginning of the last century, later called Lord Swaithling, and he, he, he wrote, is it not a suspicious fact that those who have no love for the Jews and those who are pronounced anti-Semites all seem to welcome the Zionist proposals and aspirations. And that, that was the position of most people, especially Jewish workers and trade unionists, that everything the Zionists said echoed what the anti-Semites were saying. Uh, as regards Steve's uh, point uh, and this whole debate about anti-Semitism, look, if we were to coin the English language anew, then I agree, anti-Jewish hatred would be preferable. But everyone understands and knows the term anti-Semite. And unless we get into linguistic semantics, then I think we, we are stuck with what we have. Uh, and incidentally, uh, there are no Semites. Uh, Wilhelm Marr got it wrong in 1879. Semitic referred to a linguistic uh, category, not a racial category. He he was simply wrong. Semites do not exist. But what has happened is, of course, Zionism has and is trying to redefine anti-Semitism as something which it is not, and that is what we have to oppose. Uh, I, I I think it really is that simple. And you know, the man or the woman now on the Clapham omnibus because that's the kind of test, the legal test of the reasonable person. If you ask them what is an anti-Semite, they'll tell you, someone who doesn't like Jews. The Zionists have a, an uphill struggle. It's a ruling class narrative. Most people understand very clearly what anti-Semitism is and isn't. One quick uh, pragmatic comment on, I think, what Steve had said uh, regarding the the comment that one hears often that, well, the Palestinians are also Semites. Now, I know that he was not proposing to say this, but uh, I want to add that since I hear this a lot, I think we sh should never say this. At first, it was completely meaningless, mm. and uh, it's a complete distraction. It implies that if the Palestinians were not Semites, therefore what? 
again, I hear this so much on social media that yeah. I wanted to put in my two cents against doing this. Oh, absolutely, no, absolutely, yeah, absolutely yeah. right. Yep, quite right. Okay, we've got three more people with a hand up. Are you both okay to yep, run over for five minutes or so? Yeah. Okay, we've got um, Cheryl first. If you could be quick, that'd be great. Yeah, it's just about the definition of a Jew, because can it really be described as a racial group? Because in terms of there are the Ashkenazi Jews, which I think, oh, that, does that mean white European Jews, Ashkenazis? And then there's the Mizrahi Jews, who I think are from the Middle East. And as we've discussed before in a seminar, there's a lot of racism against Miz, Miz, Mizrahi Jews from the Ashkenazi Jews. And like, if I wanted to go and live in Israel now, I mean, could I just turn to the Jewish faith and then go and live in Israel? Um, so it's just a question about the definition of Jews as, as being a racial group. And what was the other thing I was going to say? I've forgotten. Oh, I was just going to say, like Netanyahu, for example, he's not even, he's a secular Jew, isn't he? I mean, he comes out with all these biblical comments, but he's actually a secular Jew. So what actually defines you as being Jewish? There's lots of people in Israel who were secular, I suppose. Yeah, that was my mm -hmm. question. Interesting. We've got Karen in the audience. I think you you can speak now if you'd like to. Karen? Oh. oh, maybe it was a, on, a mistake. Okay, do, would you like to reply on that? And perhaps we can also use the last uh, round as a as a summing up um, if you want to, you know, have a, a last few words on, on this really important session. Thank you, Cheryl. Well, there were two groups that viewed the Jews as a race, the Nazis and the Zionists. And uh, of course, they are not. I'm I'm against the whole concept of race anyway. But even in the way that race is used, obviously, no. Um, as far as my final comment is just to reinforce what I've tried to argue that the 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 smear of anti-Semitism, the whole concept of anti-Semitism. We owe it to the liberation of the Palestinians, especially, especially as uh, as citizens of the Western countries that are empowering this. We owe it to confront this head on, never to run away from it, because it is their Achilles heel. If we turn it back on them and tell the truth, I um, thank you, and I'll turn this over to Tony. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Uh... The question of what is a Jew has defeated more brilliant minds than my own, I have to say. Uh, I've had this this discussion with Moshe Machaber, and I, I think we basically agree that, that the common denominator amongst Jews is religion. The re Zionism attempted to escape from that. It attempted to create a people like everyone else. In other words, just another nation. But... Uh, because it engaged, it, because it, it was a settler colonial project, it wasn't able to do that. So in Israel, religion defines who is Jewish, but it's not a religious state. I mean, it may become so. Uh, there are those who are pushing for Jewish law to replace secular law, but it's, it's not a religious state. The question of who is a Jew is ultimately a religious question. And that is a contradiction in Israel that half the population are Jewish first and half see themselves as Israeli first. So in the Israeli identity card in the population registry, I mean, many people define themselves as Jewish on a nas as a nationality, but then say none for religion. So there are many people who don't consider themselves Jewish on a religious basis. Uh, and I say, uh, I mentioned that uh, Palestinians are not allowed to convert because 
they are the indigenous population. Uh, and uh, if, if you can simply convert uh, and, and join the master race, then uh, very soon you wouldn't have any racial supremacy. So it, it is verboten that you can't do it. Uh, in that sense, uh, I mean, being Jewish is a racial concept in Israel. Uh, but worldwide, being Jewish in the end means your attachment in some shape or form to the religious to the religion whatever that connection is and however different that is i mean i consider myself a, a jewish atheist for example but uh, i'm still jewish uh, maybe if it wasn't for zionism uh, or anti-semitism I, I wouldn't consider myself jewish but uh, that is where i find myself so i hope that is an answer i was going to just if i could share my screen again uh yes actually it does work doesn't it I was just going to bring up this article, if you can see it, The Lost Palestinian Jews uh, from the Jerusalem Post. Uh, and it basically goes into that, uh, that if anyone is the biological descendant of the ancient Hebrews, it's not the European settlers, it is uh, the Palestinians. Uh, and there's quite a lot of stuff on that. So, I mean, I mean, that, that's why, I mean, this whole racial myth is really just a racial myth of uh, the Jewish return to Palestine. OK, thank you very much. Uh, you. The only other thing I would say, I'd like to advertise, there is a Holocaust Memorial Day meeting. I mean, we know how the Holocaust has been weaponized to justify genocide in Gaza. Uh, but we are, if you like, reclaiming the memory of the Holocaust. We have a meeting Saturday, 7 o'clock. Uh, you should be able to find details e easily. I can try and dig up the registration if you like and put it in the chat. Uh, but Ilan Pappy will be speaking, Ronnie Kasriels from the ANC. Uh, there are two Jewish Holocaust survivors who are speaking, Gada Kami, who's a Palestinian refugee from 1948. And uh, lastly, I will be speaking. So it's a pretty good lineup, and I hope people will register and join for it because it should be an interesting meeting. But thank you very much. Thank you both. The the link and uh, stuff was in the email I sent out. Um, sorry, Tom. Right. Yeah. 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 Tom, did you, you want to say something? Yeah. <laughs> great. It was a great session again. Thank you both very, very much. This is a, a subject that we all have to learn a lot about because I, this, this issue will continue for some time, uh, unfortunately. So it's really important that we understand what, what's going on there. Next week, we'll be looking at Nasser and the Arab revolutions, Pan-Arabism with, with Yasmin Yatmatha. And I hope lots of you will be joining us again. There were over 150 people in the meeting today, which is great, which shows there's a real thirst for, for understanding uh, the situation. Uh, that's going on. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much, Thank Tony. You. And, Thank uh, you, Tina. Next week, comrade. Thank yeah. you, Tina. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.